Well, let's see here. This should be fine. I see my level meters here. I'm rocking. Hi, good evening. And hopefully y'all hearing me well. Welcome to Live with Rhea. And it's Sunday night, Monday morning, UTC. Who knows? I've been told it's not my Sunday night. <clears throat> and I've been saying, okay, it's your Monday morning. My friends in UK on team replay, probably, you know, and um, hoping to catch y'all here. Well, let's see who I have here. Echo, 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 echo. Okay. And good thing. Okay. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. Still getting over this cold. Yeah, the echo is because I turned on both the camera microphone and my regular microphone. So that should be fixed now um, as we work out the kinks in this new streaming system. So um, for those of y'all curious what, what I'm using to stream now, so I'm actually using an ATAM Mini Pro, which plugs into Ethernet jack and it streams directly. It's not a... Um, I'm not using OBS anymore because my computer overheats with OBS. <laughs> And I'll crank up the reverb. Yeah, I know. And um, let's see here. Uh, the, um, yeah, there we go. Comments. Okay. Yeah, so um, OBS used to heat, my, heat up my computer. And I got um, I got a little fed up of that. So I went to B&H and I picked up an ETAM Mini Pro, which is like an all-in-one streamer. It has four inputs and it has some stuff. And, you know, I just figured... Um, I would use that. Hey, the smoking ape. Nice to see you here. Uh, and let's see here. Um, T Ray, of course. Hi, T Ray. Always nice to see you here. Um, Plasma Storm 73. Nice to see you here, too. And let's see. Don's Locks. Okay. I saw, um, I was looking, I was looking at uh, Maria Jackson. She's been in here a long time. So, yeah, so I totally do not use my computer to stream anymore, especially on Woodchucker and all these guys here. The, the problem is that my computer just can't handle it. So, um, and supply chain, there, I don't, they said March, April, could be May, who knows, probably, probably in April. Um, yeah, as far as the comments goes, I actually use a Chromecast. I got a I got a tip from Aaron Parecki. He um, used a Chromecast and and I use a Chromecast and I have a little device to strip out the HDCP. So I use the Chrome. I basically cast a tab to get the comments in. So um, yeah. So anyway, all right. So tonight we're going to talk about um, your radio, right? We're going to talk about uh, the various controls in your radio and how to make the most of them. I'm going to walk through some like user manuals and stuff like that. I'm going to show you, probably show you a little demo on my ICOM 705 because that's a rig I have here. Um, I'm also going to fire up the Flex and I'll show you some of the things I do in Flex. I have a pair of headphones so I could listen and you guys could listen along too and see exactly, you know, how I use the various filters and such like that. So, but first let me, um, let me explain to you exactly how we got here. So, um, the, the evolution started out, you know, the early transceivers were, were basically very simple machines, right? They were wide as a barn door. <laughs> okay. I should know because I have a barn and the doors are wide and, um, they mainly depended upon the operator to filter out things. They didn't have all these fancy filters and stuff like that. The transmitters, a lot of time were crystal controlled. And remember, if you look at my video about the the historic transatlantic tests, they were using a certain type of transmitter and receiver. And you know, I I spent a lot of time reading old QSTs. I'm a big ham radio history buff. Okay, and I read a lot of old QSTs, both from the AWRL archive and my personal archive. Um, by the way, anything before 1925 is free of copyright. So. I have a stash of stuff that is free from copyright that I, I use, I draw from time to time. And um, long story short, they actually, 
you know, the, the, the apparatus was simple, simpler back then. Then later transceivers got VF, things like VFOs. They got, um, you know, synthesizers. They basically became a lot better in terms of their selectivity, which is the ability to pick out signals, and sensitivity, which is the ability to pick out weak signals. And they had a bunch of filters to resist interference and all that stuff. A lot of it was based on hardware, crystal filters, and you had to buy them even even to like the mid 2000s. You know, you had to to buy um, filters, basically, that you would install in the radio. And for each bandwidth, believe it or not, you know, it's not like today's radios where you could, oh yeah, I could see like 500 hertz and then 2.7 kilohertz. You had to have filters. You know, even my Icom 756 Pro 3. Uh, you could get filters for that. So, um, yeah, so it, it kind of is like that. And then later on, um, they added digital signal processing in the audio side, right? So you'll see some rigs have AF D DSP. Then um, later on, they added what you call the IF, intermediate frequency um, DSP and Lon, yeah, you know, <laughs> the old, um, uh, Collins would, um, yeah, would drift, right? Yeah. So I wonder why this is not working properly. So anyway, yeah, it's, um, da -da. anyway, um, yeah, it was, it was kind of like, you know, this system still has a few bugs, so, okay, here we go. Right, and, um, yeah, it kind of is, um, the IFDSP was a game changer, right? What it basically meant was that you were kind of um, filtering, you know, um, you were kind of applying your, your processing in RF stage, you know? And let's see. Hey, Joe Husker. Nice to see you there, Joe. Um, Joe's going to be Joe's going to be a special guest at a conference up here. So, and um, hey, welcome to Tank Radio. Well, no, welcome Tank Radio to Via Shackham Radio. <laughs> okay, great. So anyway, yeah. So um, IFDSP was a game changer, and I I have I had two IFDSP rigs. I have the um, I have the ICOM 7000. Frank, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, I have the ICOM 756 Pro 3, which are both IFDSP rigs. So what they do is they have digital signal processing in, in the intermediate frequency stage. So if you learned about radio, you, you understand how a super heterodyne radio works, right? Basically, you start out with the RF, right? And then you mix that down into an intermediate frequency. Okay, so you have the, the raw radio frequency and you mix that down to an intermediate frequency. And then you run it through your processing there, the intermediate frequency processing, and then you run it to the detector. And, um, you know, you, uh, you do that. Silver Stacks, man, thank you very much for the super chat. You're awesome, thank you. And, um, yeah, p uh, prepping aquaponics, communications, and solar. Okay, that sounds like something I could be down with, okay? That's, uh, that's pretty nice. Yeah, Cola Games is my son, by the way, okay? <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah. So, anyway, um, <clears throat> so the eye of DSP was a big game changer. We're going to talk about how some of these are different, and I'm going to show you how some of these are different, so. Uh, there, the, the important thing to know is that, you know, as things evolve throughout the years, and by the way, now we're at full software defined radio where basically you digitize the RF at the antenna and then you process everything in software. So the whole thing is the matrix basically, right? Well, you know, you know what I mean? The whole thing, welcome to the real world. And it's, um, it's always, um, 
good because you you know you could do a whole new level of signal processing right so um anyway so let me show you uh let me see if i could bring up something here and i'll show you exactly what i was talking about with the ifdsp and um this little monitor here is blocking me so i'm trying not to disrupt anything no okay all right yeah Right, um, okay, so I'm gonna bring up this thing here. Share, airdrop. I'm a whole Apple, I'm an Apple gal. So, you know, right. And then I'll do my picture in picture. And this, and then let me see here. All right, okay. On, okay. Yeah, so you can still see me. So, um, yeah, this is what I was talking about, right? The the ICOM 7000. This was a, a heck of a mobile rig, you know. Um, this was kind of like, you know, and they were saying the technical properties and advantage of IFDSP founding our leading base station models now offers a superior advantage performance on HF50 and 144 and 43440. So basically HF, 6-meter band, two meters, 70 centimeters, right? And then you notice they tout IFDSP first in this class, right? So you have a digital IF filter, you have a manual notch filter, digital twin PBT, which is pass band tuning. And, you know, they have basically all this in the chip, right? And um, the AGC loop performance controlled by DSP now, what I want to draw your attention to is this digital IF filters. So remember I said previously you had to buy the hardware filters. Well, with IFDSP, which was actually, um, yes, it's my iPad. They're kind of like, um, you know, they're, you have all these filters. You have, you could go down to 50 kilohertz, sorry, 50 hertz. <coughs> Excuse me. Whew, that seems yeah. 50 hertz to 500 hertz, and then you have um, you could go uh, 600 hertz to 3.6 kilohertz. It's wild. Of course, with SDR you could go further than that, right? Then you have this two-point manual notch filter, right? And the notch filter, as I'll explain, basically allows you to basically, um, you know, reject. A signal within the passband okay like you could basically carve a deep notch in there right and then they talk about all this okay so let's um let me go back and I'll uh, I'll see if I could pull up one of the user manuals for these radios right and um, thank you Ed Sweeney yeah uh, let's see FT891 okay yeah, uh, all right, so let me share with this thing here, all right, okay, yeah, so we're going back here now, and um, I'm going to pop me back in here, yeah, so here we have the manual for this radio here, right, and I, I figure it's, it's nice to start with this, because this is a, you know, this is a, a relatively it represents one of the more modern radios, right? And we'll get to, to some of the, you know, the other radios later on. But, like, you know, here they explain, they basically have, like, you know, the full front controls. They have the, um, you know, the, the tuning, the main, I mean, everybody knows the main tuning knob is number 17. And then uh, they have a bunch of other little controls here, too. So on the front panel... Right, let's knock off some of these right away. AF gain control, basically number one, a fancy way of saying volume control. RF gain control, okay? So the RF gain control con controls the gain of the power amplifier. Um, not of the power amp, of the, of the preamplifier, right? The amplifier going to the main, um, to the RF stages. Now, a lot of hams now will be tempted to just turn this all the way to the right okay and what happens is they figure well you know what more gain can't can't hurt but that's not true 
The thing is, when you amplify RF signals, you also amplify noise. So what I tend to do is I tend to back off the RF gain until, you know, the signal is an acceptable level enough where I can still hear it. But you know what? I'm still, um, you know, the noise is gone a little bit, right? Let's see, power key, front panel latch, um, passband tuning, twin passband tuning indicator, okay? Menu keys. Now, a lot of these radios have things like buried inside of the, um, you know, a billion menus. And this was one of the things I didn't really like about this Icon 7000, um, right? So, okay, right. Um, let me bring up another one here that has a little more, you know, a uh, little more uh, controls here. Wonder how old hams feel about new technology. You know, you'll you'll have a variety of opinions on that. I think a lot of a lot of hams. A ham radio is the anti-technology technology hobby. I like to say, you know, because a lot of hams are like. Well, you know what? I'm not really interested in all that newfangled computer stuff. I like my old radios. I'm like, but this is kind of a technology hobby, you know? So, you know, it is and it isn't. You know, it's like it's like people tend to, you know, they tend to um to shun technology in this hobby, which is which I just find weird. Okay. I want to show you a, a real simple transceiver too, right? Back in the day, one of the hybrid radios, which was the um, the the Kenwood TS520. Okay, right. And let's see here now. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Right, so the TS520 is what we call a hybrid rig, right? So you notice it only has one, the controls look a lot simpler, okay? It has one big VFO knob, right? And it has, um, you know, no sub VFO knob. It doesn't have a second, um, it doesn't have a second, uh, how should I put, uh, a sub VFO, right? It's called fair of change. Um, I guess you could call it that, yeah. You know, I don't know. Sometimes I call it the conversion syndrome. But anyway, so the main VFO is there, right? You have a knob called RIT, Receiver Incremental Tuning. Okay, what is, um, wow, that's nice, um, TS530. Yeah, I have a TS520. I had a TS830. I have um, a Yesu 901. Those are still in Trinidad. I should retrieve them someday. But anyway, um the receiver incremental tuning. So what would usually happen is that, thank you, Michael. Yeah, you know what? I really like um, I really like the seven thousand. You know, and I was I've been mobile for that rig for a long time. You know, it's like um, it's real interesting. Um, but Michael, thank you for the super chat. When rainbows were black and white, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. So the receiver incremental tuning, um. Mike, oh uh, man, I don't know why that, that did that, but um, still working out the bugs, I think. Let me see if I could do this proper, like, you know, let me see if I could do here. Yep, and let's see here. There we go. And there we go. I don't know, I'm trying to, yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm I'm trying to figure that out. But anyway, um, yeah. So anyway, um, let me see here. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, the receiver incremental tuning. That basically is like you know. So normally, in in ham radio, you um. You understand the concept of zero beating, right? So basically, what happens is. No two radios, well, most radios are really not on the same frequency always, right? I mean, some have calibration errors, some have minor, some have major calibration errors, right? But especially if you work in CW, 
the way that CW works is that you're not going to just be both on the same exact signal. You're both basically off a little bit, beating against a, um, a frequency, a beat frequency. So, you know, you might adjust the receiver incremental tuning. What that does is it allows you to not move your VFO, to not move your main knob, but you turn the, the RIT so that you could tune and listen to this person on if if they're a little off right you still transmit on your same frequency but you tune so that you could tune them in and zero beat them in CB radios it's actually labeled as the clarifier control believe it or not okay so yeah bear that in mind okay um, yeah uh, let's see here and um, there is a band selector, and remember back in those days, they really didn't have any um, uh, warp bands. I think the warp bands came in the 70s. They were kind of like, you know, um, I don't know. It was like, I think it was in the 70s, and it became into effect early, <laughs> early 80s. Zero beating is what happens when your kids are good. <laughs> yeah, I don't beat my kids. Now, you notice on this radio as well, they have a control for JJY and WWV. So JJY and WWV, as you know, are standard frequency and time signals, right? <clears throat> what they do is they, um, even on modern radios, even on the flex, the, the flex radios, right? You could reliably tune to 2.5, 5, 10, 15, and 20 megahertz and then you can go ahead and calibrate your receiver dial exactly to those frequencies. So you're basically zero beating against WWV. And WWV is very accurate because they have an atomic frequency source and an atomic time source. So they're very accurate. So a lot of these radios now, they had a, a button where they, you could immediately go to those. So... Um, Oh, yeah, the LC Cola games. So those are um, some of the basic controls on the 520. But let me show you again. I want to bring up the next slide. Right? So um, you notice they have the AF and the RF gain again. They also have a, a mic gain, and they have a carrier control as well. And... Um, on the left side, you have some switches, right? So you have a, a transmit, receive, you know, called send. Now, a lot of modern radios have this because a lot of times, you know, you plug in a microphone on the front, right? Or you plug in a key and you want to put the, the transceiver into send and you really don't want to, you know, you don't have like a PTT button on some of these microphones. So you press the transmit button and you're able to transmit. Right, and then you press again and you go back into receive. And this one has like a flip switch, too. So, um, you know, that's one of the controls on the left. You also have the heater. So, remember, these were hybrid rigs, right? So, you had to basically turn on the heater to have this rig um, heat up the, the, the final amplifier tubes. Um, those are usually 6146s. And then you let that heat up, and then you could proceed to tune. Vox, voice operated transmit. Okay. Vox is where, for those of you not familiar, Vox is where you could basically set it up so that as soon as you speak, the radio will go into transmit, and then a little bit after you stop speaking, it'll go back into receive. The noise blanker. Okay. So I'm sure a lot of you know about the noise blanker, but I'll tell you about the noise blanker. The noise blanker is a very useful feature, especially for a mobile operation. If you drive an in internal combustion car, gasoline, you probably have spark plugs in that car. And that generates a pulsing type of noise, especially in older cars that don't have resistive spark plug wires. I think now it's pretty much required. Even like old cars are getting, getting retrofitted with that. The noise blanker would basically, at the moment it detects a noise, it would switch off the receiver for that instant, right? And um, 
then it would turn it back on when it's done. So essentially you just cut out the noise. This is not only useful for internal combustion cars, but also if you live in a rural area like I do, and you have electric fences, you will hear like a little tick, tick, tick. The noise blanker will take that right out. I mean, it's annoying, right? But you know, you turn on that noise blanker, you wouldn't even see it's there. And Joe is saying here now, uh, let's see here. What is Joe saying? FD 101 had a S 6J. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's nice. Yeah, I think these radios had a tube driver as well. I know my um, FT101 had a 6JS6. Um, the 901, I think, though, had a had a six had 6146s, if I'm not mistaken. The TS830, I know, had the same ones, and you had you had a little neutralization capacitor in them. Um, just Sony. You know, a funny story about Vox. There was this weekend in the contest, not this weekend, but some contest ago, somebody recorded somebody um, with their Vox open and they were snoring, okay, in the middle of the night in the contest and the Vox was on. <laughs> and they dubbed that over with some lullaby music and put that on YouTube. That was hilarious. If I find it, I'll, I'll make it. Um, I'll, uh, yeah, 12BY7, right, that's, that's true. Uh, and in these old radios, you know, I had, they had little problems. They had like the, the little rectifiers would go bad and such like that. So, yeah. So noise blanker is a, um, is a pretty um, amazing um, feature in these radios. But I mean, you know, it's a, it's a simplest size of noise, noise elimination. Some of these radios have um, noise reduction. And what that does is that applies some digital signal processing and basically just tries to cut down the um, the signature of that um, static noise, right? Like, you know, the kind of, the hash you hear. That works and it doesn't. So the earlier versions had audio frequency um, DSP, like the, my ICOM 746 had audio frequency DSP, where it would apply the digital signal processing at the audio stage, right? So after it gets past the detector, goes at the audio stage, the audio amplifier, it would apply the noise reduction there. And that was not as effective as when they moved the digital signal processing before to the intermediate frequency stage, the IF stage. So um, it was, um, you know, it was kind of like a, a, a it was interesting because in some cases it did work. The noise reduction in these IFDSP rigs was pretty good, but it wasn't as good as some of the newer software defined radios. If you want to hear some really great noise reduction, the Anon Apache Labs Anon radios, they have amazing noise reduction. Okay. Uh, and you know, this is, it, it pains me to say this cause I like flex, but these guys, they have a good feature on it. And, um, that, you know, just how far it's come. I mean, you know, the noise reduction used to degrade the quality, it used to sound like a cheap cell phone, you know, or a bad D-Star radio. But now, you know, this noise reduction is getting there. And in the future, I believe that you will have things like machine learning, um, applying noise reduction. If you ever looked at um, Barnacle's Nerdgasm, had it on his channel, where he was talking about, the new NVIDIA video cards, they had a software that would um, take the audio signal and then sample the, um, you know, the noise and then filter out the noise like nobody's business. So, yeah, okay. So let's, um, let's go through, let's see here, excessive plate kernel voltage. Yeah, let me go through some more, another radio I've had, which was the 756 Pro 3. And um, we will, let's see here. I have to kind of go around this here. Okay. Yeah, so <clears throat> go through the user manual here. And let's see. Yeah. yeah, and if you're new to the channel, of course, please, I'd appreciate if you like and subscribe. Um, we do a lot of good content, a lot of videos. We do a lot of lives. I do a lot of lives these days because live is just easy, right? 
And let's see here. Okay. So um, they tell you about, um, let's go straight to the front controls here. Right? So yeah, you notice that this radio is a little more advanced. I have this radio. Okay, this was the one I had before the Flex. And, um, you know, the, this radio tends to be a little more menu driven, right? That things are buried inside menus, but you still have like the main set of knobs on it. You have the audio gain, you have the RF gain. You notice you have a balance control, okay? And um, you have a, a noise reduction because, I mean, you know, you have the noise reduction on, on the front there. And then you have the noise blanker as well, right? Okay. Now, um, let's see here. Right, so they have the audio frequency gain, which is the volume control. You have the mic gain. Now, they put the mic gain down at the bottom on this radio. And, um, you know, I guess they kind of, like, didn't want people fiddling with it too much. They have the same RF gain control, the squelch, same um, arrangement in ICOMs you normally see. And as you increase, as you decrease the RF gain, the squelch tends to, um, it turns into a squelch. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, I, li I like to edit videos though, but I don't, you know. And here they tell you like the where the squelch kicks in, where the RF gain happens and where the squelch kicks in. Right? It's a combination control. Okay. So um this one, like I said, is menu driven. This this the the meter itself is actually software driven where the um you hear when you're when you're receiving it's an S meter. And when you're transmitting, it's an RF output meter, right? The monitor switch allows you to monitor your transmitted audio. So you can, you know, you speak into the microphone and you hear it in your headphones. Some people need that to confirm that they're getting out. Um, the CW side tone basically is independent of that, right? So when you're doing Morse code, you get a side tone, which is a... Um, um, you hear like a you know a tone in there that's not the actual tone being transmitted, but it's a tone that you hear you know to give you feedback as an operator. Okay, all right. Compression. So this is probably one of the more misunderstood controls. What does compression do? So compression basically changes the average power of the audio signal, and it dynamically increases the softer parts and compresses down the louder parts this way you have a signal that is generally on average louder right it's not it doesn't increase the peaks of the loudest it increases the average loudness and the net effect of this in ham radio is that um <laughs> yeah is that you you know you're actually able to punch through fading band conditions, poor band conditions, and such like that, right? Semi-break-in. Um, when you're doing Morse code, okay, you, um, you have what you call break-in. You have basically three, three modes. You have no break-in, which is where you have to manually put the radio into transmit and receive. You have semi-break-in, which is where when you key the Morse code, the radio would go into transmit, right? You send your characters, and when you're done after like, you know, half a second or whatever, it would just go back into receive. Then you have full break-in, which is after every dit and da, it would go back into receive. So you transmit, it would go quickly into transmit and go back into receive. And this is normally called QSK, okay, the Q code. Right, so the semi-break-in con delay control basically is like the hang time when you are finished transmitting, it would, it would go back. Electronic CW keyer speed control, so the CW keyer, right, the internal keyer, you want to um, set the speed in words per minute because when you 
press dot or dit or da on your um, paddles, right? Um, it would, um, let's see here. It would, you know, it would send at a certain speed, right? You want to make sure it's at a certain speed. Okay, let's see here now. They have multifunction switches. Again, this 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 rig is is very much um, menu um, driven, right? And this one has a built-in antenna switch. So you know, you press select antenna one, antenna two, and it has receive antenna port on it as well. So you can actually connect a separate receive antenna. Maybe in another episode, I'll go over receive antennas and tell you why they're important. But the long story short is that. Especially if you're operating in low bands, you want to have separate receive antennas because your transmit antenna tends to be a little noisier than your receive antenna. Okay? And this one here, you know, they have the meters that tells you what the meter, you can select what the meter does, whether it's power output, the SWR, right? The ALC, which is basically automatic linearity control, the compression metering during transmit. Okay. Um, preamp, right? So you have a preamplifier. Of course, on HF, preamplifiers. Um, hey, Plasma Storm, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. I really appreciate you. Okay. And um, yeah, you know, team replay is fine. So the preamplifier basically amplifies the signal before it reaches the first RF amplifier. <coughs> Excuse me. And then what happens is. Um, You know, it kind of on HF is not really necessary, and you you will you probably need that more in the higher bands like ten and six meters. You know, um, because that one you know you're dealing with quieter bands and you're not amplifying as much noise. Um, Carlos has a good point that I would like to share with you here that um, QSK is useful for traffic handlers in CW nets because you can listen between characters and that's absolutely true. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, what is the attenuator? So sometimes, you know what? Sometimes you get too much signal. I remember I was telling about the RF gain control where the RF gain control, you know, you don't operate it with, the, with maximum gain all the time. Well, sometimes, you know, you could turn it down, but sometimes you want a little attenuation because you want to attenuate noise that comes in, especially on the low bands, right? Like, you know, you have a very noisy band, you push the attenuator, and you, you basically cut down, you cut down signal, but you cut down noise as well, okay? Um, or even if you have a very strong signal nearby, right? AGC, automatic gain control, basically every, you know... <laughs> Every device has a certain, um, ta a certain amount of gain, and the automatic gain control basically adjusts the gain to match the signal, but it has a, a speed, right? You can either have slow, fast, or mid, you know? Fast is really not used that much on single sideband. Um, Mid is where most people need it. Okay. I did about the Vox. Um, right. Noise reduction. So balance control is when you have main and sub readout frequencies when using dual watch. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. So this this is kind of confusing because on, the, on this Icon Pro 3, it has a dual watch, but it doesn't have stereo. Right? On some radios like my Flex, you know, I could have one signal in one ear and I have one signal in the other ear. But this one just like, you know, you have both signals in one in one speaker or one um one ear. Okay. So that's that. Okay. Um I did the R R I T switch. And there is one I wanted to show you called um T S tuning step. Right? Okay, so tuning step, you know, you could basically select between like when you turn the knob, whether you're you're doing like you know ten um, ten hertz, a hundred hertz as you turn, you know, basically the rate of tuning. 
All right, so let me um, see if I could fire up this smart SDR and then show you some practical demonstrations of um, what we're doing here. So let me see here. I want to get here and then I want to do um, that, but I want to turn on my headphones, so I want to make sure I'm not blowing my own audio out. Okay. And let's see here. What am I doing? Okay. Uh, hmm. Okay. Let's see what I'm doing here. There we go. Right. So here we have 80 meters, and 80 meters is kind of. Um, 80 meters is, is, you know, is, is a band that's open right now, okay? So let's see here. Yeah, so he's talking about his batteries, okay? So let's start with single side band here, right? If I press here... You know, and this is Smart SDR for iOS. This kind of mirrors the Windows experience to some degree, but not, um, you know, not not really a whole lot, right? So uh, let's see here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, let's see here. So you know, you have a keypad that will allow you to enter frequencies. You have antenna. You could select antennas here. I have a whole. I have like one or two antennas. And um, XVTR is a transverter. I don't have a transverter. So a transverter basically is a um, is a device that allows you to operate like you know other frequencies that your radio does not natively cover. Okay, like for example, like the higher VHF bands, microwaves, etc. Right. And here I select my operating mode: lower sideband, upper sideband, AM, um, CW, Morse code. Now, a lot of radios now have this dig, um, dig U and dig L, okay? So if you're operating digital modes like WSJT or um, other um, digital modes, you want to have as little or no processing as possible. So what you do is, instead of using regular USB where you have like equalizer and compression, everything applied, you select a dig U or dig L, and that would basically turn everything off. Now, additionally, what Flex Radio told me is that they also lower the latency, so there is less delay between when the signal hits the antenna to when it hits the output, right, on these DIGEL and DIGU modes. ICOM has something, I believe ICOM has, they call it USB-D or LSB-D as well, okay? Uh, yeah. You notice they have FM and narrow FM, right? Narrow FM, um, you know, is a narrower bandwidth. And then they have RTTY. They have something preset up for RTTY. Now, remember I was talking about all the filters, right? So you have 1.6 kilohertz bandwidth, 1.8. And you notice how it, it sounds almost unintelligible at those for speech. And then, you know, as you go up 2.1, it gets a little better. 2.4 is pretty much what you need, right? Some people want to stretch out to 2.7, 2.9. 3 3.3 and 4 is, 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 ex, is just excessive, okay? You don't really need that kind of bandwidth. So let's go on here. Yeah. Right. So on the right-hand side now here, we have our... Um, we have our RF power control. I my amplifier is my amplifier is coming back actually, but I've been running barefoot on this radio. You have a tune control where you can. Um, I'm not going to press it because it will transmit. Um, well, you know what? Actually, let me do this. I go all the way. I set the tune power down to to um, to zero. I press tune. It'll basically generate a signal. There. Okay. I didn't put any power out. I don't want to transfer that identifying anyway. MOX, manually operate, uh, operated transmit. Remember the same send and receive, same transmit switch. 
that I told you about, TR switches. And that's basically the push to talk button here. ATU antenna tuner. A lot of these have antenna tuners built in now, a lot of these radios. Right? Um, memory, okay. Now, the Flex does the compression a little different, right? So, by the way, this selects, you know, which is the audio input device. So, I could select it from the iPad here. Um, the processor, they only have three levels of compression here. They have normal, which is none. Well, normal is just, you know, the base level compression. If you turn this off, it's nothing. But you have um, processing normal, which is minimal amount of compression. You have DX, which will punch you up a little bit. Then you have DX Plus, which kind of like, you know, will get you really compressed hard so that, you know, you're pushing out a lot of power here. Strange that they only have um, three and the other radio manufacturers have a, a whole comprehensive set of them, right? Um, they have um, profiles for microphones here. Like I have a bunch of different microphones here that um, they include. I use a Radio Sport M350 here for, um, you know, for my thing. Then um, the ACC is basically through an accessory port. You can connect an additional audio source. DAX. Okay, so DAX is their digital audio exchange. DAX is a virtual sound card device that installs on Windows, right, or, or Mac OS, where um, it would send a digital bitstream and a virtual sound card, and then you use that. So you don't have any cables or anything like that, and it's completely pure, pristine digital audio. You have the carrier control here. You have Vox. You have now this digital expander, right? This is, um, this is a, a way of saying a gate, okay? So I don't know how many of you here are audio people, but I'm kind of a, I do church audio, so um, the downward expander is, is what you call a gate. So like when, the, um, when, the, when you have periods of silence, what happens is the microphone, the audio will just cut completely out, right? I, I don't like harsh gating, okay? Gating tends to sound so harsh. I like to have a little bit of that background noise. If you have a light amount of gating, it works in a noisy environment, okay? No aesthetic D104. You know what? I have a D104. I haven't hooked it up, All right? Okay. And here you have, like, the noise blanker. I was hoping, well, somebody, one of the neighbors would have electric fence going, but maybe they fix it. But you have the noise blanker here. You, know, Gary, for a long time, I didn't watch you have the noise reduction. Uh, I, uh, you see? North Carolina. You have this automatic notch filter. What this automatic um, notch filter does is that, you know, you drop that on top of a carrier or something. All right, let me see. This. That's not a carrier. Let's see here. And this will attempt to find the noise source and basically get rid of it. See? So you press that. It will find a noise source and basically notch it out. Okay? Right. Div is diversity received, meaning, but Flex uses a different kind of um, diversity. They have um, where it is um, basically they just feed one into, into each ear. Here you have your bandwidth control right um you know and here's the graphic equalizer receive or transmit i have it on transmit i have you know i have it punched up a little bit on trans i don't have anything on receive tnf is track and notch filter that's a flex feature where basically you can drop a filter anywhere on the spectrum and then have it basically stay persistent there and you can set it to be deep so let's see if i could drop one here what is this I think and this is one of my batteries or something. All right. Let me see if I could do this here. Uh, let's see. Oh well. Yeah. Usually, um, you could drop a TNF. FDX here is full duplex, meaning that how you could receive on the second receiver while tra while transmitting. Right. Um. They have a whole bunch of little um, controls here. You know, they have, um, oh, let's see here, not that. 
you know, lots of little things that are buried in menus. You know, like again, a lot of these radios are menu driven now, right? So, um, let's see here. There you go. So on these radios now, you can open up open up a separate um, slice. You know, plus RX, you get a second one. Yep, automatic notch filter is good when somebody you're listening to is just off frequency tuning up. Yep. All right. Okay. And then this, I could kind of just like, I don't know, slice B, I could get rid of this guy. Okay. Um, split operation is different from just, um, so split opens up our separate VFO. And then what it does is it'll automatically configure it to transmit when you key up, right? So, you know, and it automatically gives you like um, uh, five up, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll automatically um, go five kilohertz ahead. So this way it's configured for normal DXing, right? Okay. Um, oh yeah, the track and notch filter. Okay, yeah, let me, so I just do a plus TNF, you see? See that track and notch filter? I could just drop this bad boy on this here. And that's persistent, you know? Yeah. And that, that'll stay there. And you can have, I think you can have an unlimited number of these anywhere you want them in the radio spectrum. Right? Okay. So. Uh, let's see here. Um, the bandwidth. Well, this is the bandwidth of the entire pan adapter. Um, I could ad adjust the display, all sorts of things on display here. I could adjust the rate. I can increase the rate that the the waterfall goes. Um, the gain. I could do a gain up here. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, by the way, this Smart SCR has a built-in logbook, so I can actually go and, um, you know, log a QSO in here. I go tools, let's see, Marcus gave me access to a bunch of these here. Uh, logbook, right? You see, and I have, I have a whole logbook here. So a lot of interesting stuff. Let's see here. T-Ray is saying... Um, yeah, you know, you know, you want to know something when you um, when you get into it, you know, it gets it gets really addicting, you know. Um, let's see, Adesh, how are you doing? Yes, um, I am. I am actually from Trinidad, by the way, in case you didn't know. Okay, so uh, amrs.tt, cool, nice. You might know some of my friends down there too, like Leon and all of those people. Always nice to have people from Trinidad in here. Uh, T-Ray is saying, I still have a lot to learn about the Flex. Yeah, you know what? I still have a few things to learn. I had a Maestro. I sold a Maestro. I really, you know, I'm not really a fan of that kind of control. Um, you know, the Maestro is great for people who love knobs. I'm just not one of those people. So let me see if I could pull up here this ICOM 705, and then we could tie the ribbons on it. Um, yeah, so the, the logbook is actually in Smart SDR for, um, for iOS. And it's not, um, it's not in the Windows versions here. So I got my IC 705. Okay. And you notice this radio as well is heavily menu driven too. But the thing about this radio is that it's it's more of a touch screen more than anything, right? So you have your basic controls that you have on the front here. You have your audio frequency gain, you have um the power well power button, vox. Um you have the twin pass band tuning, which allows you to basically adjust the center of the receive um, passband. And then, you know, beyond that, I mean, you know, you have to go into a billion menus in these radios, right? Like, for example, um, 
audio, you know, let's see here, to do the attenuator, uh, let's see here, well, um, SWR set, you know, others, <laughs> yeah, the 705 kind of, kind of is, yeah, and the reason I think that's deliberate because the 705 is both a VHF, UHF, and an HF radio, you know? So anyway, um, the thing I don't really, I wish that the 705 had was a dual VFO where I could monitor too. I mean, it's an SDR. I don't see why they couldn't have it, but I guess, you know, for whatever reason, ICOM decided not to, not to have that. Um, and not fluffer. You wanna know something? I was in a uh, a luncheon with K three L R, okay, and um, in Texas a few years ago, back when we had those things, and he was like, "Hams love knobs," and I'm thinking to myself, "There's so many ways you can go with that, okay." Um, <laughs> yeah, so um. But look at this, you know, this is like you have to touch the screen to change the bands, right? And I go down to like 14 megahertz, okay? And then, um, well, you know, quick menu. You see, everything is so menu driven. Maybe there's a firmware update for this. So, you know, well, anyway. <clears throat> I really hope that this gave you a broad overview of some of the controls in your radio. I might do a few more of these workshops, probably to do a little more in-depth, and then we could do some operating as well, too. And, <laughs> yeah, T-Ray, um, funny guy. But, um, you know, it's always good to know what's inside your radio. And what I tell people is that um, before you do any contest or any DX, you know, take some time. Do some listening, right? Go through the manual and then try to to actually, you know, do some things on the radio. That TS520 I have, I have a problem with it where the sensitivity, I think, dropped off. So I have to see if anything is wrong inside that radio. And then, um, you know, what we, uh, what we need to do is probably, um, probably... I don't know, look and uh, look it over and um, do some, do some, uh, some surgery on it. So let's see here. And I'll do my Chromecast again. And let's see here. You know what? The 7300 is actually a, a nice radio. Okay. It's a nice radio. It's just not you know, um, it's not that portable. However, right? Um, yeah, you know what? Watch from the beginning. I mean, you know, all my videos are always up online, so it's fine. <coughs> I like the, um, I like the, the value you get in the 7300, okay? For the price, I mean, it's unbeatable, I think, in terms of the value, you know? Every time I say that, Ray Novak smiles from ear to ear, okay? Um, <laughs> but you know what? They really did make a good radio. Um, at the same time, I think definitely that, um, you know, it probably could use some updates in terms of, like, I don't believe it has the same Wi-Fi control. So there is software you can get for the 705 on the Mac that allows you to operate it like a flex, believe it or not. And, um, you know, I might get it... Um, I might get when when I get paid, so we'll see how it goes. So thanks for watching live with Ria. I um I really appreciate it. I'm gonna be um next week. Well, we're gonna have a stream next week. The week after, I'm gonna be in Denver, Colorado, um, for an AWRL meeting, and then um I'm actually gonna be in Long Island this week too. Hey, things are things are busy. Uh, David, thank you very much for the super chat. And let me see if I can bring you on the screen here. Um, yes, it works. Thank you very much. 
you know what, Ron? Yeah, you know, I think they have their place, okay? I like the flex for what it is. I do think, though, that um, as an all-in-one, I think the 7300 does does pretty much hold its own. So, um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a very good night and a good week ahead. I will post a poll, or I'll post another free form um, post asking for topics because I want this to be your stream. And before I go, um, those of you who've been listening to WTWW Shortwave, I did send a message on their phone line to the people of Ukraine. Um, my brothers and sisters, my ham, ham friends in Ukraine, I hope and pray that they will not suffer this war by Vladimir Putin anymore. And um, I really, you know, it really breaks my heart to see these kids and conscripts from Russia just being thrown, you know, as cannon fodder. It breaks my heart. I really hope that um, they could end this soon and Putin could probably just go and slink in a corner. <sighs> Brandon ain't making it any better either. Anyway, all right. No, that's that's an, another thing. Okay, guys. Peace in 73s.